Access, the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845, and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Hey, Green Lantern fans, thanks for joining us for episode number 168 of the podcast of OA. This episode, we're going to be talking about DC's breakup with Diamond Comics, and we're going to do another You Are the Core segment, as well as our Green Lantern fun fact and some Green Lantern news. This is Myron Rumsey, your co-host for the show, and joining me is podcast of OA co-host Phil Bova. Hello to all. How's it going out there? On a side note question, should we call everyone Owens? Since this is the podcast of Oa. Yeah, you know, that's not bad. We could call them Owens. So hello, all of you Owens. It sounds like a Southern thing, though, a little bit. It kind of does. I don't know, man. Well, you you should put like a voter poll on the website to see what people think about that. Yeah, you know, that that wouldn't be a half bad thing. We'll we'll try it out. (laughs) So anyway, hello, all from St. Louis, Missouri. Hope everyone is well and safe and, uh, Happy, and I hope they're enjoying their summer. Yeah, summer's finally here. You know, at least it's nice to get outside now and enjoy the weather a little bit. Yes, we have been taking walks after walks after walks with Clark and the dogs. I think the other day we took three walks and at three different places. So one in the morning, afternoon, and at night. <laughs> you, you do realize that you need to get a new dog. You need to get a puppy for Clark and name him Crypto. Oh, I thought about that, but... I don't think our two dogs would handle another dog being around, and I don't think I could handle another dog being around. It's <laughs> so, a handful as it is. I don't think I could deal with another stress. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> since our last episode, there really hasn't been a whole lot of Green Lantern news. Uh, one thing that was announced was DC kind of released a sneak peek of their their September solicitations. And, you know, there's a big event coming up that's, um, you know, it's the, the whole Dark Knights event that happened oh, a year or so ago. They're doing a Dark Knights death metal uh, event. And there's like three or four um, prestige format books that are coming out. And supposedly with the death of Generation 5 and that whole 5G plan, this is going to be kind of a big thing, I guess, for DC. But in the third volume, which is called Dark Knights colon Death Metal colon Multiverse's End, uh, written by James Tynan, uh, it's going to have Guy Gardner in it and lead along with a, a group of people, including uh, Captain Carrot, and uh, going off and trying to save the multiverse. So, side note question to that event. Now, I'm 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 vaguely familiar with their tie-ins that were early on. You know, they had the the Green Lantern one, Batman. Um, is it? I haven't really followed the story arc very well. So is that like an alternate multiverse? Uh, it's it's our multiverse, and I'm not exactly sure what's going on. I have not been following things. I feel out of the loop a little bit. Okay. Uh, I I know there is supposed to be a guidebook coming out uh, either this month or next month. I can't remember which. Uh, that's supposed to help people with the story. If you haven't been following it, I, I read, I read um, the 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 you know the metal event. I read that, uh, but right. I haven't followed it much since then. Uh, yeah, that's kind of where I dropped off. And because I remember there being an Aquaman one that had a metal tie-in, and it was a uh, it was a female. And then you remember the Batman Green Lantern one, correct? Oh, Dawnbreaker. Yeah, yeah, I, I enjoyed Dawnbreaker. Yeah, I did too. I I mean, and I don't say much good about Batman, but I did enjoy that particular book. But I will say, side note, it was only because it was Green Lantern related. Did you see that the uh, McFarlane is doing a um, a Dawnbreaker action figure? Oh. oh, I don't know if I could justify buying it though. It'd be like having a, a Batman. You know what? I could pawn it off on Clark. I could say Clark wants it. There you go. It's Clark's Does fault. He- yeah, because he may want, he may like Batman, and I don't have to, but I can still have it and still appreciate the Green Lantern part of it. Okay, so that's so, my associated value right there. That's that's justification right there. I, I have a question for you. If if Clark ends up liking Batman, is he out of the will? Yeah, well, I think what's going to probably happen with that is we're going to have probably many many discussions down the line. And, you know, I'll, I'll feed him the information of why I don't like Batman, and, and, and I'll tell him who I like. But I'm going to allow him to like what he likes, because, it's you know, he, he has he's free to choose. But there'll be an underlying kind of 
um, competition going on between me and him. And I'll make sure he knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Other thing that isn't so much Green Lantern news, um, but it is interesting Green Lantern information. Um, Phil, did you know that there was a Green Lantern video game that was going to be released in the 1990s? I did. It was going to be. I, that, it was going to be Kyle Rayner because it seems like everything lately has been Kyle Rayner. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Frank Gaskin, and Frank runs a website called Games That Weren't dot, got, dot com. I can't, if, if I could speak, you know, um, Games That Weren't dot com, and it's a website that he's been running for quite some time now, and it focuses on uh, basically archiving um, games from the Commodore line of computers, the the Amiga and the C sixty four, and even the Vic twenty, and he is also a historian on video games in general. And he has for seven years worked on this book that is coming out that's called The Games That Weren't. And it's a 644-page book covering a wide variety of unreleased video games going from 1975 to 2015. And it's... Mega research. Oh, yeah. yeah, A huge, huge project he's been working on. He contacted me uh, two or three years ago because he was looking for information about Green Lantern because he was writing a section on the Green Lantern video game. And so that's going to be included in this book that comes out. But uh, he asked me some questions and I kind of gave him some background. He wanted to know what was going on in the comics at the time and and why Kyle Rayner and not Hal Jordan and those kind of things. And so we had some conversations back and forth. Well, as it turns out, he's listing me as a contributor in the, for the book. Which is really cool. Man. Good for you, buddy. So uh, he's covered more than 80 games. And he has screenshots and blueprint pieces and interviews with creators. And really interesting thing. It, it's about a $30 book and it's it's being sold in the UK. So, you know, depending upon uh, the exchange rates, it's a little bit more here or there. But it's out for pre-order. So I'm going to put a link to it here. And I'll, I'll be doing an article on the blog of OA here in the near future. But uh, he, he emailed me out of the blue and said, hey, it's taken me a few years to get this thing printed. But uh, it's being printed by uh, a book company called Bitmap Books, which publishes a lot of video game books that are not, you know, not your mainstream kind of thing. You know, your, your big video game website publishers and things like that. Um, so it, it looks pretty cool. He, he sent me some some graphics from it. I unfortunately didn't have any any graphic on the Greenland game, but to, to show me from the book pages, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, like I said, he, it's neat that he interviewed me. I, you know, I don't know whether he just was looking for somebody who was dumb enough to, to sp- give up some time or what, but uh, I was very appreciative that he gave me a credit in the book, which is cool. So no, and that's it. I mean, this is like a, a project, man. I mean, this is like an endeavor to take on and, I'm looking at it right now. I'm on the website. It looks pretty cool. The book looks really, really neat. Yeah, it, it looks really nice. Uh, and I'm not pimping the book. I don't get anything for it or anything. I wasn't paid for my what information I gave him. But I just think it's a neat project. And for those people who really were interested in that game at the time, because I remember, I remember back in the day, there, there used to be some magazines. There were a lot of video game magazines back then. And I remember a little blurb. I think it was Game Pro Magazine back then. And it, it talked about the game. And uh, it just unfortunately never saw the light of day. And he, I think he's going to be talking to creators of the game, talking about why it didn't see release. And there are there are actually some videos out on YouTube of the guy who did the music for the game. And you can actually listen to some of the music that would have been in the game had it been released. But see, like the gaming industry right now is, is huge. And this is just like an added element to it for, for gaming historians. I mean, no, I remember back, <laughs> I remember when my family went out and bought the Atari when it first came out. I you do know? too. The twenty six hundred was the, yeah. the first console. Yeah, right on. I remember having a Commodore sixty four too. And yep, yep. You know, and just just the the way the, where we've come since that time. You know, these kids jump on and they play, and that's what they're used to. But I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing like seeing where it was before and where it started at and experiencing it to what it is now today. I had a VIC-20 when I graduated high school because I was going into programming. That was my field of choice. And, you know, back then you had a, a cassette tape drive to store your your yeah. programs on. And yeah. the VIC-20 only had 2K of memory. 
Yeah, that's what I mean, man. It's like those little, remember those little floppies you had to, you know, you had, was it like a megabyte or something like that? The the six inch floppies? If you were lucky, you could get that much on it. Some of them were 256K. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, and it's, I, it's just incredible where we've come. It is, know? it is. I, I, I remember when uh, the VIC-20 came out that William Shatner was pimping it in magazines. <laughs> gosh. That cracks me up, man. That brings back the old days, man. Those old and old commercials for video games and stuff, you know, like Joust. Oh, just I don't know. I still like playing the old stuff, man. I'm not gonna lie, but the the, the new the new things they have out is just mind blowing. These kids today can't appreciate an eight bit sprite. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> oh hell, no. it'd be like them trying to appreciate a a twenty bit photo. I mean, can you imagine these kids trying to blow up a photo? <laughs> I mean, there's no photos that exist to me probably pre-2000, you know. And if they do, I'm, I'm, in, sole, I'm in sole control of them. I have them all in a, in a place. But, like, like you could, we got away with so much stuff back then. And, like, it was never documented because you did, normally didn't have cameras. But now it's everywhere. I, I remember having to walk to the arcade in the snow in the middle of winter, yeah. up, uphill both ways. Yeah, man. We had a, we had this St. Clair Square Mall. It's still there. It's in Fairview. They had Aladdin's Castle. It was an arcade, big old video arcade. And then they had another one. It was the Sears Arcade. Man, I remember just I remember they had those little uh, things on there for the ashtrays. <laughs> There was always burn marks or scorch marks in the plastic. <laughs> Back when you could do stuff like that. Right. Eat how a did, piece of pizza. <laughs> how did we survive? <laughs> oh, my gosh, man. I tell you. So anyway, I, th- I think we've got a fun yeah. episode coming up. We're going to talk about DC's breakup and with Diamond Comics distributors. And then we've got a You Are the Core segment. Uh, so I'm excited. Let's, uh, let's, get, let's get to it here. All right. Sounds great. Welcome back, all you Owens, to another fantastic Green Lantern fun fact. And this one is a special one for all you John Stewart fans. As late as 1970s, superhero comic books were still shockingly white. There were a handful of minority supporting characters, but really nothing in the way of lead characters or fully fleshed out heroes. DC's first major step towards diversity was the creation of John Stewart in, the ni- in 1971. The young, fiery architect would initially serve as Hal's substitute, Green Lantern, and would eventually headline the series for several years in the 1980s. While the character has had a bit of an uneven run in comics, Jon Stewart became the one and only Green Lantern for an entire generation due to his inclusion in the 2001 Justice League cartoon. That version of the character is easily the most iconic, given life by Phil Lamar's tremendous voice acting performance and the character's star-crossed romance with fellow league member Hawkgirl. And there you have it, fans. Another awesome Green Lantern fun fact. Especially goes out to all those John Stewart fans out there. Well, Phil, DC Comics kind of set the uh, the comic book world alight in the last couple of weeks when they announced that they were parting ways with Diamond Comic Distributors. Uh, a lot of people are up and armed over the whole thing. Uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to my comic shop myself, but have you had any input or any heard anything from your comic shop? I have not. I did stop by there the other day. They're doing curbside uh, apotheosis. Now I do I do go to two now. Well, I usually frequent apotheosis, but they're closed till July, and uh, I haven't talked to him. But I did talk to the guys down at uh, Comic Book Headquarters. They're a little south of me, and. Uh, I would assume that everything is just remaining normal because their shop is open and they've been keeping up with new titles when they've been coming in. So I don't know if they're going to, I don't know how I understand there's a blow up about it, but I'm trying to understand why there's such a uproar about it just because DC shifts uh, a different vendor for public, for publication, I guess you can say. Yeah. I, I think, some of it comes from reading some of the coverage. You know, you've got Lunar Distribution and UCS comic distributors are going to be doing the releases of periodicals for DC. I think some of it comes from comic book stores now having to create accounts with another vendor 
and then um, now you're shipping, you're paying shipping on two different shipments instead of just one. So maybe there's a little bit of loss of revenue there. So I think there's there's that part of it. And then I think some people are afraid that if DC's not with Diamond, does that make Diamond less uh, have less, less less profit, and does it risk? their viability in the in the industry the other side of the coin is is diamond uh, you know during this whole covid crisis diamond was basically telling the publishers that they weren't going to get all their money for the books that were were shipped so that's not really a good thing and i i don't know how every comic shop's experience has been with diamond but i know that there's a history of smaller shops in particular getting shorted books um I know my comic shop, comics, uh, Heroes Your Mom Throughout Comics, here where I live, they've often gotten shipments that were missing books altogether. Just recently, uh, you know, they they opened up. We 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 opened up about two weeks ago, and I went down to get my copy of Green Lantern uh, season two, three, I think it was, yeah, number three, and. Uh, he was there, and he only got half of his shipment. And right now, there aren't that many books being printed. So, what does that do for a small store when half of your product isn't there, and you're paying for it, you know, but you don't have it? Right. I, I would assume that a lot what took place during this COVID thing probably. I mean, I don't know. DC is always shuffling about, and when DC shuffles about, they usually do something on a on a big grand scale, <laughs> and it's like it it normally comes out of nowhere with them. You ever notice that it's like they just they pull these these big moves like this and i'd like i don't think it's going to affect anything i don't i don't know i mean it's a bigger question than i have an answer for it and you could probably devote a whole a whole podcast to that you know right yeah i mean we don't know the behind the scenes stuff that's going on that's for sure i mean it certainly is making waves and we don't know you know is it dc really making that call or is it at&t making the call no one really knows, but boy, has it turned into a big storm of activity online, at least initially. It seems to have died down a little bit, but some some comic retailers were like, that's it, I'm not going to carry DC. There was one uh, comic book retailer, I think it was Mile High Comics, that was doing a 50% off of all DC back issues using the promotion code DC sucks. So it's <laughs> <laughs> there's some backlash there. You know, I was going to partake of that sale, but... Boy, the books that he had were overpriced to begin with. So, whatever. Um, so, I, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, monopolies are never really a good thing. So, would it be great if there was some competition in the marketplace? It might not be bad, but I do feel sorry for some of these comic shops that might find it more difficult to make their bottom line when they're paying a little bit more for shipping between two different vendors. I, I, you know, who knows? And are they going to hold the books that DC puts out on Tuesdays for Tuesday's release? Are they going to hold them for Wednesdays to, to make it line up with everybody else? Or are they going to put Tuesday's book out on Tuesdays and Wednesday's book out on Wednesdays? Will that change traffic patterns in the store? I, I, who knows? Right. Yeah, it's tough to say. I mean, I'm sure there's there's a lot of questions about it and a lot of things about it that are outside of my knowledge of how the system actually works internally. So, you know what I could do, though, is next time I talk to uh, the guys at Apotheosis, or if I go down to Comic Book Headquarters next week, I'll uh, I'll start up a discussion with them and see if I can come back with some little bit of answers next week. Yeah, maybe we can do a follow-up topic. I mean, we've got, yeah. in the next two weeks, we've got a new issue of Green Lantern, and then we've got that ADP, the uh, GL80 100-page Super Spectacular coming out. So we've got actually new books to talk about over the next two weeks, but maybe we can revisit this topic after we talk to our comic shops. But for those uh, people out there listening, if you've got an opinion about this whole thing, share it with us and let us know what your perspective is and do you think this is a good thing? Do you think it's a bad thing? Uh, do you not care one way or the other as long as you can get your books? Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest things is if shops uh, retaliate against DC and stop carrying the product, what's that going to do to the, to the DC market share? And one of the interesting things is is that the, the numbers that you see for statistics like on Comicron, they track sales, but they track sales in terms of just the pre-orders that come in the diamond. So what happens with all the DC books? Do they no longer get counted because they're not part of Diamond? Or are some of these sales aggregators going to have to work with more than one vendor? Because now you've got two. And who knows what they're doing with the international books? What are they doing with the, you know, in the UK and other parts of the world? I, I don't really know. Right. 
it's a uh, it's certainly interesting. I thought it was interesting that that Jim Lee really didn't say a whole lot about it himself when you know he's the publisher in chief essentially. So I don't know. I don't know. It, they I, never I, say much about anything. It's always like some kind of like. I don't know. That's the thing that bothers me most about DC and Warner Brothers. Everything about them is so secretive. You know, it's like they feel like they, there's some kind of need to keep things veiled. But I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I, I, it seems like they like to do do everything via press release. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just I like I like companies that remain transparent with their fans and yeah. stuff. And I think one of the things that I liked about Dan Didio, one of the things I respected about Dan Didio, was that he was a champion for comics, and you you could tell he genuinely loved the medium, and he would do things, fun things like tease upcoming events and things like that. And I think even though maybe he might be towing the corporate line, at least he would have said something himself if he were there. Right, could be. Oh, those are the days. We, we'll see how this all pans out. It's certainly going to make for interesting times if comic shops stop carrying DC products. Uh, I, I hope that doesn't happen. I'll but, be hate life. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. All right. All right. Well, my friend, we've got another segment to record, so let's take a quick break, and we will come back in just a uh-huh. momento. Great. This is Salak, Green Lantern of Sector 1418, and you are receiving the podcast of Oa. The podcast of Oa. Welcome back to the podcast of Oa, and it's time for our favorite segment of the show, You Are the Core, where Phil and I sit down and break comic book bread with a fellow Green Lantern fan. Joining us this week is Colin Schneider. Colin, welcome to the podcast of Oa. Thanks for having me. It's very cool. So how long have you been a Green Lantern fan? Uh, like a year. That's it. Wow. Um, so but newbie. in that year, it's really spiraled out of control, to be completely honest. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> so what got you interested in Green Lantern in the first place? Well, I've always been a big, big cop comic book fan but uh mostly uh stuff like batman or team books justice league avengers etc um but i i'm also a huge huge grant morrison fan so when i heard that he started doing a run on green lantern i was really interested i picked up like the first like seven or eight issues all at once at uh my my comic shop and just sat down and read them and i was just blown away that led me to go back and read Jeff Johns's run, which led me to go, wow, this is really cool, but I know there's a lot of stuff that I'm not getting, and a lot of that stuff isn't like accessible online. So I said, screw it. I'm just going to build a complete collection, and I just kind of went from there. Um, as far as I know, I have every Green Lantern issue you know, between collected editions and single issues. Gotcha. So awesome. let let me ask you a question because people, when we talk about the Morrison run, some people um, are critical of the run because they don't feel reader friendly because there's a lot of, you know, you know how grand is. He does a lot of deep dives. Yeah. Did, did that dampen your enjoyment of the story at all? Well, I was, I was more or less familiar with Green Lantern when I started the series. Um, and I'm also, I, I like to think that I'm pretty well versed in just DC lore in general. Um, so I wasn't like just completely green, if you excuse the pun, getting into it. But um, I, I mean, I enjoyed it quite a bit, um, partially because like I, I really enjoy when Morrison's getting weird and this is very weird. Um, I don't know if this would be the first series that I'd recommend to a new reader unless they have read Grant Morrison before. But um, I do enjoy it quite a bit, and I did enjoy it as a new reader. I think what really got me, like, especially interested in it was uh, issue seven of the first season, where Hal's trapped in the power ring, and he's going through the, uh, um, like, maze with the uh, wizard Mirrodin and stuff. And I thought that was just really cool and really well done. Um and that, that, that really especially stuck out to me. And I think any new reader could probably understand what's going on in that issue. 
at least. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Now, just out of curiosity, do you read your books digitally or do you get the hard copies? I have a mixture of both. Um, I have about 500 trades and about 10,000 single issues. And then I have about 40 or so books on uh, digitally, but I also use a Marvel unlimited uh, and uh, DC universe uh, because they both have like 20 plus thousand or thousand uh, issues. So it, yeah, it's a mix. It depends on the easiest and cheapest way to access it. Right. So does green lantern, now that you've gotten really kind of done a deep dive into it, does it mean anything in particular to you? Or is there anything that resonates with Green Lantern as a franchise or a set of characters? Well, I think the whole idea of willpower, um, you know, that inner strength really resonated with me. Um, I've had some struggles in my life that I, uh, especially before I was into this stuff, that uh, I kind of used like my inner willpower to just kind of push myself through it and uh i don't know it kind of spoke to me but i think the thing that speaks the most to me is um charles Sewell's uh red lanterns run which i i don't think i hear anyone talking about really when they talk about green lantern stories that are unbelievable uh he did a very brief run uh it was only like issue 21 to 35 or something um but in it was that was when Guy Gardner joined the Red Lanterns, and it was really a fascinating um, look at kind of how to harness and use rage productively. And I've also struggled a lot with um, uh, some anger issues in my past, and I don't know. I thought that, that was just really interesting and it helped quite a bit. And uh, for a while, it made Guy my favorite Lantern. Um, which I know is a controversial statement in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> like who we like, man. I mean, as at the end of the day, and we, Myra and I have discussed that a lot, it, we like who we like. And, you know, there's, I don't know, it seems like there's been a lot of conversation around Kyle Rayner lately. It's just... <laughs> but, after uh, going back and, after re going back and uh, reading Ma the Mars and Banks run in the 90s. Kyle's my favorite, but that's mostly because I grew up reading like Ultimate Spider-Man and it really just had that feel. And I mean, Daryl Banks' art is just phenomenal. But uh, guy, guys up there and the Red Lanterns are definitely my favorite core. Now, have you read Grant Morrison's uh, Kyle Rayner's? Uh, I read JLA a long time ago. Um, I have not picked it up again. Uh, I'm planning on doing a deep dive into Justice League sometime soon. Right now, I'm working through Incredible Hulk, so that's kind of taking priority. But um, I, I did read it. I just didn't read it when I had a lot of Green Lantern context, and I wasn't paying attention to him. I was mostly focusing on Batman. <laughs> hey, you know, he's reading the Hulk. He's keeping it green. <laughs> mm. I think that uh, Morrison has a uh, JLA omnibus coming out. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. I'm probably going to pick that up, that up. Yeah, I think it comes out like in October, and it, it's huge. It's like a hundred and fifty dollar mm. book, but it, it covers like every. It's like over five, over fifteen hundred pages. Yeah, I think it's I think it's his whole run, because it's a little too short to split into two volumes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's the whole thing. There's nothing more beautiful than an omnibus, though. I mean, just oh god, no! I I've started collecting them. I don't have a ton. I have I have a about eight but um every time there's a new one i put it on my list um <laughs> i love them yeah they're just they're just they're a beautiful book man and they look so good on the shelves and yeah mm. so i imagine with all the comics and stuff you have you probably have a pretty good collection of between comics do you have a lot of toys and stuff too do you have anything in particular that's favorite oh yeah i have a lot of lantern collectibles uh i went a little hog wild this past year um so i'm a, i'm on my gap year between i, I took a gap year between college and or school and figuring out what i wanted to do uh working at a comic shop so that gave me access to a lot of goodies that um most people wouldn't be able to find normally uh my favorite is i have the red lantern prop battery um 
the coolest thing I own probably is I have a hat with an original Alan Scott piece of art from Martin O'Dell. Um, and he signed it and I've got a bunch of other signed figures too. Um, so I was, I was pretty excited about that. I want to get, um, all of my other favorite lantern artists to do a little sketches on the hat to really make it awesome. Um, I have a, I have a bunch of signed stuff, um, a couple statues. Um, I think all in all, I have like 300 some pieces in, of just like collectibles. Um, and my, uh, younger brother, uh, for my birthday made me a stuffed itty, uh, you know, the, the worm thing that was a sidekick in the seventies. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, I thought that was pretty fantastic. That's cool. That's awesome, man. That's a great collection, buddy. Thank you. What would you like to see collected in an entire trade for publication? Uh, just a regular size trade? Um, I'd like, honestly, a trade collecting the uh, Green Lantern Mosaic series. And I know that's controversial because the author is not a good dude um uh but i don't know that story was phenomenal and um i i would really love to see uh the the art especially just on like nice glossy pages um i mean it's 18 issues long so it's a bit thicker than your normal size trade but i'd, I'd love that um it's probably one of my favorite lantern stories um that's, that's and it's definitely, definitely one that's left that's definitely we haven't done really uh myron you and i we haven't done a dive into that have we no no we haven't we probably should should, should take a look at it and you're right you're right callum that's one that that you know i think begs to be reprinted because it it was such an interesting and trippy book but you're right with the gerard jones controversy and such uh i think they've canceled any plans they had for any of his material i know there was supposed to be uh, a trade of some of his early green lantern run and uh, you know the, the yeah. road back and that whole stuff and that all got canceled in light of uh his his criminal activities but yeah i'd love to see that stuff get released nonetheless um so we've got time for for one more question um we're, you know, we're going to be coming to the end of the Morrison run here after these these 12 issues of the second season are done. What would you like to see happen with the Green Lantern franchise after that? Uh, well, I have a couple ideas. Um, one, I'd like to go back to like an anthology series like they did in the 90s with the Green Lantern Corps quarterly. Um, maybe do it uh, a monthly series, regular sized issues. But uh, each story arc focuses on a different lantern or a different time period or something. You know, I, there are so many cool characters, and that's one of the things that really draws me to the universe. And it's just kind of ignored. I'd also like a book that isn't focused on Hal. As much as I love Hal, um, you know, I, I really want to see my boy Kyle get some more uh, stuff where he's an actual green and not a white lantern or, or whatever. Cause that stuff was good, but I, I, you know, I miss, uh, him as a green lantern as the torch bearer, you know, um, maybe give a, maybe do like a team up book. Um, like the movie supposed to be where it's Hal and John as partners doing partner stuff, you know, somebody that something that's not just Hal, And then maybe a book that's about, um, some of the other cores, like the red lanterns are my favorite. Favorite, but um, all of them are especially interesting. And other, other than the yellows and the reds, none of them have re- none of the others have really gotten much attention. Um, especially the uh, star sapphires. Like we know very very little about them outside of Carol as star fa- sapphire in the uh, silver and bronze age. So I, I don't know. Just explore the mythos more. You know, expand it out a bit more than just how. Well, there's a, there's a whole hanging plot thread with the Indigo tribe. You know, during Godhead, mm-hmm. they kind of betrayed mm-hmm. the Green Lantern, so we haven't seen them since. And I'd love to find out where they are and what they're doing. I'd like to see maybe a, a confrontation between the Green Lanterns and the Indigo tribe. Well, the Indigo tribe got, like, I, I don't know if all of them died. I do know that Monk died and quite a few others were killed by Lobo when right. Sinestro was having Lobo hunt them down. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if uh, Iroke survived or not. But yeah, I agree. That'd be really cool. I love the Indigo Tribe. I built a uh, 
so I do some word working and I built a uh, homemade Indigo Tribe power battery because oh, they never so released cool. any. That is um, so cool. I'm still working on getting the uh, light in the actual uh, lantern part, but uh, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. When you get it, when you get it done, you got to send us pictures of that. I will. I will. <laughs> Because that, that's something that really should have gotten made. You know, they made all the power batteries and the Indigo yeah. Tribe didn't get the staff. And it, it's like such a perfect prop that they could have made and released and they didn't do it. But, you know, I, I agree. An anthology book, you know, back in the day, you had the, the Tales of the Green Lantern Corps as a backup in the Green Lantern book. And it mm-hmm. became so popular that it became Green Lantern Corps quarterly. And you could I could totally see a core book that had the Green Lantern Corps with a backup feature that featured either, either Green Lanterns or other cores. Um, there, there's such a ripe opportunity there for that. Absolutely. Or heck, even do like a one time a year, just graphic novel that's focusing on a different character. You know, um, like like this year we got uh, the DC Zoom book on uh, Thai Fam, which mm-hmm. was excellent, by the way. But, um, you know, do something like that where it's a graphic novel every year where we look at a different lantern and like a deep dive in comedy or not, you know. Right, right. I mean, that was kind of where I, I kind of felt disappointed in Far Sector because you had so many existing lanterns. Why not give them an opportunity to have a story like that? It could have been a really great thing just for that character that maybe didn't get a lot of exposure in the past or a character like, you know, Ayalande or or yeah. um, uh, Irishia, give her something to do. It would have been kind of cool. But, you know, it is what it is. I feel like DC's kind of stepping away a bit from Irizia just because of some of the concerning stuff that happened in the late eighties with her and how um, that's kind of, I, I, I feel like that's kind of why she's only ever in like group character moments, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they tried to, they tried to work their way around that, but um, some people can't let go of that stuff and you know, yeah. But all right. Well, Colin, thank you so much for joining us. We've, we've it's had a no blast having a conversation with you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Cool, man. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light! All right, fellow Owens, welcome back. And that was another spectacular uh, segment and another spectacular podcast again, Myron. Yeah, yeah, I had a great time. Collins are a neat guy. I, I can't wait to see the pictures of that uh, that uh, Indigo Tribe staff. Yeah, it's gonna be cool. It's, it's gonna be cool, man. Uh, I wish, like you said, you and I have talked a lot about how, how they wish we wish they would have made that a prop set uh, when they released all the lanterns. Because I got the green, I got the green lantern, lantern, the one that lights up at the ring. I have That's... the original one that they did a long time ago that came in a box that was like Hal's locker. Oh, awesome. Man, where'd you find that? Uh, I bought it when it originally came out way back in the day. Uh, and then I bought the yellow the yellow one not too long ago. And those are the only... Man, you wound me, man. I wish... Uh, there, there's a guy in the Facebook group for the Blog of Oa that has a friend that does 3D printing. And he's making 3D printed versions of the lanterns that are more comic accurate than the ones that DC put out. Because they, you know, DC, when they put out the blue one, basically just took the green one and made it, cast it in blue. And this is with the handles designed the way the blue lantern is supposed to look. And um, so he's done a lot of those redesigning of things. And the, the red lantern looks very much like the red lantern from the, the comics. They're they're very comic book accurate. And I, I'm dying to get them. But, you know, as we were talking off mic, we only have so much money. And I want, really want to fill in my back issues and complete my Silver Age run. So spending three or $400 at a time on a power battery would be... A little out of my price range. Yeah, I gotta say, Clark's gonna get in the way of a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of my collecting. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I could say it's his collection too. There you go. I, I guess you know. if you keep them in the box and stuff, they're collectible. It could, you know, help him towards his college fund. That that is true. That is a that's good justification. Right. Um, you know, um, I, I can um, find an excuse for almost anything. <laughs> 
it was a cool episode. So I'm excited. You know, we've got some some big things coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, next week, we got a new issue of the Green Lantern. And the week after that, we've got that giant 100-page spectacular that I'm sure is going to be an entire episode just unto itself. It will. Also, Myron, we still have uh, listener feedback, too, we got to do. Oh, you're right. I forgot all about that. Uh, we there have a go. voicemail. Thank you for reminding me. No problem, buddy. We're here. We're so, here. Uh, you got to keep me on track, man. It's all right. Time's so, uh, getting away from us. COVID <laughs> messed the whole time scheme up. <laughs> I don't even know what day it is half the time, I swear. God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we have a voicemail. It's anonymous. So let's uh, let's play it, and then we'll uh, we'll re- respond to it. Okay. Hey guys, I'm just calling to say how much I love your podcast. Uh, it really feels good to have a place where I can listen with other Green Lantern fans. I mean, I know it's a popular character and it's been around for a long time, but sometimes I feel like people just do not give the time to really understand how beautiful that lore. And that history really is. I fell in love with Green Lantern when I was a kid. Me and my brother would fight over the action figure from the old Super Friends line. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to be Green Lantern because he could literally make anything that he imagined. Uh, the Kyle Rayner run was my first real in depth and, uh, then fell in love with Jeff Johns as Hal Jordan. And, uh, you know, just been carrying on since there. I feel like it's not just a fandom, it's a uh, spirituality to some level because it really brings in so much of life. So uh, thank you guys for representing that and, uh, you know, keep your light shining in that darkness. All right. All right. Well, thanks for that listener feedback. And I got to say, uh, Myron, this, here's another mention of Kyle Rayner in there, you know? A lot of these '90s guys, you know, that got into it in the '90s. You know that, that Kyle was their first Green Lantern. You know, I think they, they, you know, there's been a lot of observation that whoever you read first becomes your Green Lantern. It's who you associate yourself with. Yeah, that is true, and I, I, I like his uh, call out to the Super Friends man, the old the old action figure Super Friends line. That was the very first Green Lantern action figure. Was that Super Powers figure? Yeah, it's cool. Very cool. And Super Friends. You know, a lot of people talk about the Justice League show. The Super Friends was the Justice League of my day. And and I don't know if you remember back in the day, but Saturday morning cartoons were such a huge thing because it was really the only time you could watch cartoons. And there used to be primetime specials before school would start in the fall showing you what the the lineup was going to be for the the fall season. I mean, primetime specials on network TV about Saturday morning cartoons. I mean, you can't get much better than that. No, man, you got up, you had your you had your cereal. And it ran from like seven to about to about noon, eleven or noon. It was when it would teeter off. At least that's what I remember teetering off. Yeah, yeah, it was right around noon. It would end. Um, yeah, I here here where I live, we we got a lot of our programming from Syracuse, which is a couple hours from where I live, and uh, I, I still live where I grew up. And it used to be early in the morning, like at six o'clock, they would have some local programming, like kids shows that were live action. They were basically kids in a studio audience, that kind of thing. And that would be on at six o'clock in the morning and that would go until about eight and then all the cartoons would go. And I remember with my, my little brother, we would sit back and figure out, okay, we're going to watch this and then we're going to watch that. And you'd plan out your entire morning around it. And then lunchtime would come and every Saturday my mom made hamburgers. And then at one o'clock we had a locally produced out of Syracuse, a, uh, a horror movie show with horror hosts. And that would carry us until about three o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. It'll never be like it was though. I remember, I remember the times when I was grounded, which was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was allotted uh, one hour. Uh, I think it was one hour a day of television. And anyway, I remember I would get home from school and I would watch my half an hour of G.I. Joe and then the half an hour of He-Man that followed it or it could have been vice versa. And I was good with that. But I don't know if you remember. Okay, so you remember Voltron, right? It was a little after my time. Voltron was in the 80s. And I was graduating high school in the eighties, but I still watched cartoons. But. <laughs> gotcha. They had another Voltron that was uh it was it wasn't the Lions, it was made up of some a bunch of vehicles. Nobody really remembers it. I'm having a really hard time trying to find the uh the cartoon. Huh. Yeah, I I don't remember the Voltron that was the vehicles. 
Yeah, it was like a bunch of vehicles, and a bunch of vehicles made up one segment. And if I remember correctly, it was like land, sea, and air, and those formed together to form Voltron. I don't know. I could be wrong. Anyway. There was a team. I, I just went to Google, and there was a thing. There's a Voltron wiki, and Voltron had a show called the Voltron Vehicle Force. There it is. See, look at you, man. There you Voltron go. Wiki, I think of that. Yeah, I remember watching that. That wasn't as good as the Lions, but, you know. Well, I mean, Robot Lions. I mean, you can't I mean, top right. that much, really, can you? No, you can't. It's cool stuff. I was doing some, uh, I know we're talking a lot about cartoons here, so real quick, I'll, I'll, I'll slide this in. I was doing some research into, uh, I, I just get, recently got all the Speed Racer episodes. And uh, it used to be called Mock Go 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 it was in, Jap- uh, in Japanese, and it was. Uh huh. I, I went back on YouTube and watched some of the early, early stuff, the first original stuff before it came to the States, and uh, it's good, man. It's really, really cool. That was one of the first um, anime shows that made it to the U.S. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was in the. Really, that was in the sixties. Oh my God, it was. Yeah, like, yeah. I remember watching yeah. that as a kid a lot. Um, and then in the seventies, for me, it was uh, Battle of the Planets. Yeah, that was another good one, man. There was another one next to Battle of the Planets that had the fiery phoenix, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct, correct. That's right, right. My brother was big into that, and then I, I came. I was see, I was born in seventy four, so I, I came out on the tail end of those. And then, of course, I came into the Hanna Barbera phase, the 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 eighties. You know, they used to package Battle of the Planets, which was Gachaman in in its original form, with a show called Star Blazers, which was um, oh, it's it's Yamato is spaceship spaceship Yamato. I probably got the title wrong, but two really yeah, cool shows. That, I don't remember that one. I do remember Battle of the Planets, so interesting. But you I probably remember Thunderbirds through too, right? Oh yeah, I remember Thunderbirds. Yeah, Thunderbirds are cool. Thunderbirds are go. They are. Hey, we've been talking about cartoons. We need a whole segment on cartoons. <laughs> we have to start another show. Just on. On just- a side note, if anybody out there is in is, is in broadcasting or whatever, put a little put a little bug in somebody's ear that they need to start on some streaming service a replay of Saturday morning cartoons from about seven to noon. <laughs> they could webcast it. It would be awesome. A, a live all stream. Originals on there. Transformers would be on there. I think they were on there at one time. Yeah, there, there was anyway. just so much cool stuff back then. There, there was. But, uh, we, but we, thanks we, for the listener. Thanks for the listener. <laughs> yeah, we kind of digressed and got off the beaten track. But yeah, I appreciate the, the voicemail. Was, I, I love hearing from, from folks, and I appreciate people taking the time out of their day. And, and, and thank you for that. Motivate us to do even more. Absolutely. And we've been having fun doing these uh, weekly. You know, they've been they've been a good time. You know, it's uh, the You Are the Course segments have just been a delight to do. And uh, I just love being here, man. It's, I'm having fun. I, it's it's funny because I thought these episodes were going to be shorter and they end up being just as long as a regular episode. <laughs> well, they, they totally are. We, <laughs> but, we, you know, we, we, we talk freely and stuff. And then, you know, we just you, you get to talking, man. And we, we just... We, we fill our time because it's like catching up with friends, just like our fellow Owens out there. That's right. That's right. So uh, we'll be back next week to talk about the Green Lantern. And uh, we, might, we might have a special guest for our You Are the Core segment. I've got to finish lining it up. But one of the bands from my music articles contacted me and expressed interest in coming on the show. So we might have a, a musical on with us next week. I can't wait, man. I hope that I hope it works out, and uh, I can't wait to meet them and and chat with them. And it's awesome. And you guys need to get on the website or uh, get on uh, Myron's website and check out his uh, three part series on that. It's it's awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, my fellow Owens, as we've now dubbed you, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week with another installment. And uh, until next time, it's a crazy world out there right now. So treat each other well, keep your power ring charged, and make every day your brightest day. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. 
you can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.